Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. Good evening, brothers and sisters, friends and family. It's good to be here again sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with you. Welcome to our midweek ministration. It's an honor and a privilege to be here again. If you're joining us for the very first time, this is Living in the World International Church, a place where we preach Christ undiluted and spread the message of his salvation and love to all mankind. We have been studying a series of teaching this month, which is titled, Lord, I Need a Miracle. This is the 11th month of the year, 2016, and each and every one of us began the year with a vision, with a goal, with an aspiration, something that we desire to accomplish this year. The year is fast rolling by, and we're about to say Happy New Year. Within the next few weeks, we'll be preparing for Christmas, and then we are preparing for the new year. But you see, God took six days to build the heavens and the earth, and to create it, and to fashion it, and to make it beautiful for humanity to live it. I don't believe it it will take six days for him to build our lives or give us what we desire. So this month we are crying to him and asking him, saying, Lord, I need a miracle. And I believe each and every one of us need a miracle in one aspect of our life whatsoever. Yours might be uh, financial challenges. You might be in your marital relationship. It might be um, getting engaged. It might get a partner. It might be in your career. It might be your place of work. You need a miracle. And God is always ready to do something supernatural in your life. Now, tonight we want to look at a subject which I've titled, When God Stretches Our Limits. When God Stretches Our Limits. The fact is this, growth is an inevitable factor of life. That is the truth and the reality of life. And sometimes growth will not come except through pain. I can remember as a teenager that when I was growing up, as I began to, uh, people say I stretched or at least rapidly grow in terms of my height, I experienced pain in my knee and the pain was so severe. And then we went to the doctors and the doctors said there's nothing they can do because I just have to grow and extend and my knees are growing and my body is you know, getting increasing. Sometimes the greatest spiritual lesson that we learn or the growth that we experience in life comes through pain, suffering and adversity. Real spiritual characters are developed not through times of comfort, but through times of intense pain. So I'm believing that tonight God will open our eyes as it begins to stretch us or stretch us rather in areas of our life he wants us to grow. So that way there's no retardness in our lives and we can come to the fullness of the image of Christ. And I believe as you listen that God will open your eyes of understanding in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Now shall we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you glory and honor. We bless your holy name. We thank you so much for your grace, your mercy, your compassion. We thank you so much for your love. We thank you for thus far you've helped us. You've been our God and our Savior, our Redeemer. Indeed, Father, you've been faithful. Lord, as we sit at your feet this evening to, to study your word, please open our eyes of understanding and reveal your perfect counsel unto us to the glory and praise of your holy name. Thank you, Savior. Blessed be your mighty name. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. I'm always excited to share the gospel of the, um, the words of God with you because I believe the words of God contain power. That we need to get our life from where it is to where we want to get to. Now I begin this these um, teaching tonight by saying to us that uh, as parents, for those who are biological parents, one of the greatest things that gives you joy, one of the things that gives you um, pleasure is to see your children grow. And God is not exempted from this process. One of the things that God wants to see in our lives is growing and maturing, moving from babyhood into maturity of adulthood in every spiritual sense. Life is very dynamic and growth is an inevitable factor of life. Life is equal to growth. Where there's life, there must be growth. And anything that's not growing, it definitely is dying. A problem a child can suffer is when he refuses to grow, whether physically or mentally. Then you can say that maybe the child is, has a, some kind of deformity. And oftentimes doctors and everybody begin to run around elder skelter looking for ways to you know, get him to begin to grow and act his age. 
It would be a sorry sight to see a grown man who is in his 30s or in his 40s or 50s still wearing diapers. That means he has not grown from babyhood. That means when he was supposed to be producing, he's still being fed milk. So spiritual growth is then an obligation for all Christians. It's a responsibility that we must all grow. It's so important that God allows us to go through certain situations because it is good for us. Not all, not all things that are happening to us are bad. Because some of the things that we go through help us mature as Christians, help us mature as believers, help us mature as individuals. It refines our spiritual character. Oftentimes, I tell people that in the books of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, the Bible tells us if any man is in Christ, a new creature, all things have passed away and all things have become new. The moment you surrender your life to Jesus, then all of a sudden, you're a new creature. But the issue or the caveat with that is that we need to renew our mind. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, you know the scriptures that we should always renew our mind, as Paul has said. Sometimes I say a software upgrade for those who are into IT and computing. Now, until our mind is renewed, there are certain things that God cannot release to us. So sometimes when he allows us to go through certain things in life, he wants to mature us so that he can give us certain blessings that we desire or we have been acting of him. Job said in the books of Job 23 verse 10, he said, when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. When he has tested me, Psalm 66 verse 10 to 12, the Bible says, For you, God, tested us. You refined us like silver. You brought us into prison and laid burden on our backs. You let people ride on our heads. We went through fire and water, but you brought us to a place of abundance. God will bring you to a place of abundance in the precious name of Jesus Christ. There are several reasons why God needs to stretch our limits. Number one is to increase our capacity for more. You know, if you go to the, to the ocean and you take a spoon to the ocean, the capacity from which you can draw from the ocean is based on the container or the instrument or the bucket or the cup you've taken to the ocean. So, for example, you take a spoon, you can only, only take a teaspoon or a spoon full of water from the ocean. If you take a cup, you can only take a cup full of water from the ocean. If you take a bucket, you can do exactly the same thing. But if you take a tanker, a water tanker, that carries tank. Guess what? You can take a tanker full of water from the ocean and the ocean will never fill it. There's sometimes when God needs to stretch our limits so that he can increase our capacity for more. He wants us to dream big. He wants us to dream mighty things. You see, the limit for every Christian is the throne of God, not the sky. That's why oftentimes I reject the prayer when people tell me the sky is your limit. The sky is never my limit. At least we understand from scriptures that Paul said, you know, he was caught up to the third heavens. So if there are three heavens, why are you limiting me to the sky? Number two is to get us out of our comfort zone. Many people remain in their comfort zone forever. We want to remain in nursery and never go to the spiritual battlefield. God wants to move us, move us out of spiritual nursery into the battlefield. Remember, we are soldiers of Christ. He wants us to leave the realm of milk, 1 Peter 2 verse 2, and move to the realm of meat so that we can begin to get matured in our faith. Comfort zone is very comfortable. Nobody wants to get out of their comfort zone. But you see, one of the ways God gets us out of our comfort zone is through pain Allowing pain, allowing adversity, allow challenges to come our way. If I was still the same way I was when I was a, when I became a Christian over two decades now, then I won't be fit to preach the gospel to you today. So it the it, our desire to get out of the comfort zone, or sorry, or God desire for us to get out of our comfort zone is to stretch our limits and bring us into the fullness of Christ. Number three is to mature the fruits of the Spirit in our lives. 
to mature the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Many of us have the fruit of the Spirit in us, but they're green. They're not ripe yet. Have you ever gone to the, to the um, department store, grocery store, and I've gone there to buy fruit? And all of a sudden, when you get home, after buying the, uh, the fruit, spend your hard in cash, and you sink your teeth into the fruit, with an apple, or pear, whatever you've bought, suddenly, you know, you have this very salt taste in your mouth, that, you know, you feel, I have wasted my money. When God looks at us and we are not matured, he sometimes feels that he has wasted the life of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary because we are not maturing the fruits in our lives. Christians still lose their temper. Christians too backbite. Christians still keep malice. Those kind of things show that we are yet to be matured as Christians. So maturity of the fruit of the Spirit is one of the reasons why God would like to stretch our limits. Number four, I believe now, is steadfastness. Many of us are one leg in, one leg out. And the only reason why we go to church or go to God is when we're actually in trouble. Yes, we have given our life to Jesus, but apart from that, we do nothing else for him. But you see, when we have challenges, somehow that's when we stay on God and stay on God only. Especially when we have run elter skelter and we have not gotten solution, all of a sudden we stay on God and say, Lord, I know if you don't do it, nobody else would. So then he makes us very steadfast. Steadfast in our walk with him, in our study of the word, in our spiritual growth, so that we are constantly developing and maturing to the image of Christ. Number five is to mold us. Who do you take after? Who do you take after? If two people come together, a man and a wife, and, and his wife come together, and they have a baby, the baby often will take after their parents. If God is our father, and is the one that gave birth to us spiritually, then how come we don't look like him? You know, Christ could say, Father, forgive them, even though he was on the cross of Calvary, after he has been scourged and beaten mercilessly, and then nails in his hand, he can still say, Father, forgive them. He is in the fullness of God's image. He said, he who has seen me has also seen God. So we are supposed to be molded into his image. And one of the ways we do that is that when God stretches our limit, your will be done in our lives, not our will. From glory to glory is changing our lives. It's time that we begin to experience God in a new way, maturing and becoming what he has called us to be. And I'm praying that in this season, where you're asking God for a miracle, that God himself will mature you. Number six, because God does things in unusual ways. Why does God stretch us? He does things in unusual ways. God is never conventional. I mean, if you can read the stories of the gospel of Jesus, you will often find out that he does some healing different ways. There's some things you believe that he would do the same way he did. Sometimes he would just say to you, be unto you according to your faith. Sometimes he will lay his feet on the ground, uh, put the mud on your eyes. Sometimes he'll tell you, go and wash in the, in the pool. He will do all kinds of things. God is never conventional. So whatever you're going through and you say, well, Lord, Mrs. A did not go through that, but you gave him this. God is not conventional, and you don't know the seed or the prayers that Mrs. A has prayed. So don't look down or look up and say, well, Lord, how come you're not doing this for me when you did this for the people? Yes, I have said that God is not partial. Yes, I believe the Bible says God is no respecter of man, but we must change according to his own will, not according to our own, our own will. You may have been a Christian for 50 years, but if you are not obeying the word and you are not walking in the spirit, then you are still living fleshy. And then God will always do things conventional to get your attention. I pray that it will not result to that level before it gets your attention in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Now, what do I do when God is stretching my limit or how? Do I go overcome it? You see, life is not about self-will 
It's about God's will. I said earlier, when we say the Lord's Prayer, oftentimes we say things that we don't actually put our mind in understanding what he says. I remember teaching on forgiveness some time ago in church. And um, what I was saying, and I said, sometimes people say things they don't know. You say to God, forgive me as I'm forgiving others. And then you hold malice in your heart and you wonder why God is not hearing your prayers. Remember, you will not hear the prayer of a sinner. He said his ears are deaf to their prayers. And he said, if we regard iniquity in our heart, the Lord will not hear us. So we must begin to move from certain things. Now, the old and the new. Many of us are very comfortable, comfortable in our old ways. Although it's not efficient or it's not effective, but we like comfort and we don't want to change. Now, one of the things that God would do to get you out of your comfort zone, like I said earlier, is to make situation around you uncomfortable. And then you begin to look for an efficient way to get things done. One of the things that Jesus Christ met with great opposition with is that he wanted to change things, the things, the way things are. The Pharisees and the Sadducees did not like that. They want to preserve the old ways at all costs. And hence the reason he had to die. You've heard the phrase, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Oftentimes you have to fix it before it gets broke. So that you don't have to spend double. Our mindset needs to change. Our mentality needs to change. Our mindset needs to change. When we, come to, when we talk about God. And it begins to stretch our limits. Because then we increase in wisdom to be able to ac accomplish or achieve greater things. There's so many things that the Bible tells us when it talks about spiritual growth and maturity. It means following after righteousness. First Timothy chapter 6 verse 11. It means transforming our mind. Romans 12 verse 2. It means perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1. So, I want us to be built up in our holy faith when it comes to um, God stretching our limit. Remember these words, Hebrews 13 verse 5, that he will never leave us nor forsake us. So growth is inevitable and it's important that each and every one of us not become sentimental when it comes to going through challenges and begin to um, threaten God. And say, well, Lord, if you don't do it, I will leave. I, will, I, won't follow, I won't follow you anymore. It's time to be focused. Because after he has purified you, you will come out shining like gold. Or silver. In the precious name of Jesus Christ. Number three, learn to listen and wait. When God is stretching your, your limits and your boundaries, because he wants to increase your capacity, learn to wait and listen to him. You know, one of the things that the devil does very well is creates confusion. He creates confusion. He likes thunderstorms. He likes all kind of things ringing. That often gets us to move from the path that leads to life and ungodliness. Because of all the things around us, we often run into the hands of our enemy instead of run into the hands of our God, who is able to save us. And I'm praying that in this season, that God himself will help us with whatever miracle that we desire in this 11 month. Number three, pray inquiry prayers. I love the story of Rebecca when she was pregnant with the two, the two boys, um, Esau and Jacob. When she was pregnant and you found the baby jostling in her, in her stomach, in her womb rather, she went to inquire of the Lord. Many of us, rather than ask the Lord, we fight the battle before we actually know the strategy to use. So while we are shouting and wailing and we get um, frustrated, we get um, we feel anxiety, maybe we should ask God and say, Lord, what should I do? David in the scripture never lost the battle because he kept inquiring of the Lord. God's timing is different from our timing. And this is so important. So when you ask him, he will be able to tell you the right strategy to use to get the miracle that you so desire. If you constantly focus on him doing a particular way, you might miss him 
when he's actually moving in your life or you might work against him to accomplish what he wants to do. Number four, humble yourself under the hands of God and in due time, he will exalt you. The Bible tells us clearly that God resists the proud. Many of us are prideful. Many of us, um, we, we believe we know it all. You know, pride goes before a fall, the Bible says. So we must be very, very humble, especially in challenges. I mean, one of the ways God humbles us anyway is challenges. Because he shows that you have no strength of your own, you have no power of your own, and he's the one that is backing you up. And I pray in this season that God himself will never leave you nor forsake you in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Number five is that you hold on fast to God. You hold on very, very fast to God. Hold to God on changing hands. Many of us, sometimes the moment we feel any pain, that's the time we stop coming to church. You expect the, everything to be done for us by the church. So we believe that is our right, is our, um, our uh, is, is church duty and responsibility. Now, when you're going through challenges, that's the time you need to serve God more. That's when you keep God at the center of your heart. That's when you give him greater adoration. That's the time you give him greater love. And give him more time and devotion to him. Because again, you know that you're ready. He knows when he sees you that you're ready for what you want to do. Or what you what he wants to do for you. Humility is always a launching pad for all Christians. So I want you to keep your heart focused on him and him alone. Number six is that you sow the seed of what you want to see in your life. You know, like beget like. You can't plant um, mangoes and expect oranges. So sow the seed of the kind of answer you want to see. If you want help, begin to sow help. Help others. Many years ago, I was traveling back to London from America. And there was a thunderstorm and a rainstorm. Sorry, a snowstorm rather. And the ground, I mean, the snow was so heavy that cars were getting stuck. And the only way, uh, so I went, uh, the car was in got stuck on the road, rather. And the only way we could get out was to ask other people to help us. Now, nobody was willing to come and help us, but I, we could see people um, helping each other move the car, move their or other cars that has been stuck. So what we did was we got out of the car, we helped other people, other people moved their own car, and all of a sudden we went back into our own car and they came to help us too. So the kind of harvest that you want to see, that's the kind of seed that you begin to sow. And I believe as you begin to do these things, that God himself begins to move in your life in a, dra in a dramatic way that he will blow your mind. Now as I begin to close, the benefits of God's miracle in your life, well, you can tell by yourself. It could be healing, it could be um, transformation, it could be the change of heart for your uh, children, it could be your husband, it could be your wife, it could be anything. But you know what you desire from the Lord. How bad do you want it? That's the question I want to ask you. And I believe as you begin to do it, that God himself will show up on your, on your behalf in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Now shall we pray. Father... In the name of Jesus, we give you glory and honor. We bless your holy name. We thank you so much for your grace and your mercy, your compassion that never fails. Thank you, Lord, for the word that comes forth tonight. I pray it shall mingle with faith in our hearts and bring forth good fruits in our lives. To the glory and praise of your holy name. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise God.